Luke 15 is a very popular chapter in the New Testament. I know, I've got to turn this on. And uh, in this chapter, you find the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost silver, and the parable of the lost son. I dare say that it could also be described as the parable of the recovered sheep, the parable of the recovered silver, and the parable of the recovered son. I'm glad the Lord's in the restoring business. And uh, I'll be honest with you, Brother Greg Neal did a wonderful job in his preaching down there this week. And he preached one night out of this chapter and in passing he said something I couldn't get away from. And uh, I'm going to give you that little thought that I couldn't get away from. But let's begin reading. Gain the context of this passage of scripture. We'll begin reading verse 11. The Bible says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose, and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, and had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it. Let us eat, and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what uh, these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, notice he didn't call him his brother. He didn't say as soon as my brother came home. He said, as soon as thy son hmm, is come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots. How'd he know that? Thou hast killed him, the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. I tell you what, Brother Phil, why don't you stand and pray for us? <coughs> our Father in heaven, we come to you, Lord, in the name of your precious, precious Son, Jesus Christ, who is our everything, Lord. I pray you come yeah. be in here in this presence right now, Father. I can feel your presence already. Lord, what a joy it is to be in the house of God this morning. Lord, what a joy it is knowing that you, I'm heaven bound with my hammer down. What a yes. joy it is to come to <coughs> hear about the preaching of the Word of God. Yes. Lord, I can't wait to get started. Lord, I love you and I praise your wonderful name. 
Today is the day for salvation. Yes. Harden not your heart towards the things of God. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you, Brother Phil. I want you to notice three principal characters in this passage of Scripture. In this passage of Scripture, we see the younger son, we see the father, and the elder son. I want you to notice their attitudes. The younger son has an attitude of rebellion. He's rebellious. <coughs> Somewhere along the line, he gets word and sees shining lights in a distance of a far country. He says, I tell you what, everything my father's worked for and everything he stood for doesn't mean anything to me. I'm headed that way. Yep. He's rebellious in his attitude. I want you to notice the attitude of the father. He has a compassionate attitude. Under the law, when that son came home, he should have been stoned. But the father ran and fell on him and kissed him, had compassion, called for him to bring the best robe. That was the father's robe. Put the best robe on him. Put a ring on him to show he was the son. Put shoes on him. Remember what the son said. He said, I'm no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me a servant. He put shoes on him. You know what that's significant of? Slaves didn't wear shoes. Hmm? Wow. Father's compassionate. Matter of fact, he saw that boy come from a long way off and ran and fell on him. But he shows his compassion to the elder son. When the feast is going on, he noticed the elder son's not there. And he goes to him and shows compassion and entreats him and tries to help him. The father's attitude's compassionate. The older son... His attitude's one of anger and bitterness. Hmm? Look at verse 28. It said, and he was angry and would not go in. He's angry because his brother got right. He's angry because the father had the audacity to throw a feast for his brother. He's angry and he's bitter because truly in his heart he wished he'd went out there. But he stayed and he worked and he had anger against his brother because he's doing his job and his brother's job. Yeah. And now the brother gets right and he's angry. Can I say? There are sometimes people sitting in the house of God that's never strayed from the things of God. But they're angry and bitter. Amen. They're angry with a brother in Christ or sister in Christ. They're angry or bitter because somebody that's left. Or they're angry or bitter over something. Listen, he who angers you controls you. Bitterness eats you up. It'll cause you not to enjoy the blessings of God. He didn't enjoy the blessings of that fatted calf. huh? Even if he's angry with his brother, he should have got in there and got him big ribeye. You know what I mean? Sure. Huh? Angry, bitter. We see their attitudes. Notice, if you will... They're ailing. The younger son. He wasted and was in want. Look at verse 14. And when he had spent all, there rose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Wasted everything the father gave him, and now he's in want. <coughs> you know what I've noticed about people? There are some people who don't have any sense. There's some people you can give them $10 and in about four months they'll have a thousand. Right? Because they know how to work. Know, know how to take that $10 and make it worth something. Amen. Have you ever heard them stories about people win the lottery and then within three years they're bankrupt? Yeah. Yes, sir. Because they waste it. <clears throat> Did you ever see any of these ball players? You know, the life expectancy of an NFL ball player is about three and a half years. So get paid. In the NFL, you don't get your big contract till the second contract. But still, they'll get paid about three, four, five million dollars, Colonel. Then they'll buy them a big house, 
they buy mama a big house, buy all their friends a car, then they get hurt, <coughs> never get the second contract, then they're working at McDonald's. Because they don't know how to take care of it. Hmm? Huh? The father gave this guy his inheritance. Yes, sir. I don't know how much it was, but it was a lot. And he goes and he wastes it. Blew it. Matter of fact, he blew it on riotous living. Amen. Hmm? You know what riotous means? There was no pleasure brought before him that he did not commit. Wasted it. And as soon as he did, there's a famine in the land, and now he's in want. Notice what the father is ailing. The father's broken hearted at the house because his boy's gone. You know why the father saw him a long way off? Because I believe the father went out every day and was looking for him. Every day that boy's on his heart and on his mind. Father's weighted down with that. Some of you got children that are out in the world and that grieves your heart. You raised them right. You taught them right. You showed them what the Bible meant, what the Lord would do for them. But everybody's got a will. And they've chose to go a different path and it grieves you. I've got some good news. The Bible said train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old he'll not depart from it. Right. Just keep praying, keep looking for them, keep serving the Lord. One day, hallelujah, they'll get right with the Lord. Just pray that way. Hmm? Amen. Can I say that older son is ailing because he's resentful? Hmm? I've known people in the house of God. I'm not even preaching yet, Brother Clint, but I've known people in the house of God that resent when somebody else in the house of God gets a new car. Resent when somebody gets a new house. I've seen them even resent when somebody gets a, gets a new dress, a lady gets a new dress. Isn't that foolish? First church I pastored. Y'all know the story. I left that corporate job and I'm pastoring. Brother Ray tell you they, they couldn't afford to pay me but about $150 a week. And I had traded a lawnmower for a car. It's not much of a car when you trade a lawnmower for it. It was one of them little Hondas I could have drove from the back seat. I really could have. But I bought it because I was doing a lot of work on the side and I could put all my tools in there and I could put ladders on top of it because it was a little station wagon and all that. And I mean, it, its tires were wore out when I got it, Brother Ron, but I couldn't afford to put tires on. I just kept driving it. Kept driving. Well, it came to the point I needed a vehicle after a couple of years, and I just went and bought one. I bought a used one. Matter of fact, they gave me $400 for that Honda. I was going, hallelujah. <laughs> but I bought a little Cutlass Supreme. I mean, it, it, it wasn't a lot of money. It was $6,000. As soon as I drove that down there to church, you should have heard some of the people down there. Oh, we're paying the preacher too much. He bought a new car. I heard that. There are people full of resentment. Hmm? Uh, I know every time Brother Clint brings in one of them new exotic cars, I resent him. <laughs> I mean, he's brought Land Rovers in here. He's brought Maseratis in here. Uh, Jaguars in here. Lord have mercy. Don't you resent him? <laughs> Today he was kind. He, he drove Rhonda's car. He drove that Mustang in here. Huh? But he's got a boy that works at a dealership where they trade them things and he gets them for next to nothing. And then he charges Clint about double for them. And he'll buy them. Uh, but who cares? The Lord blesses him to drive a Rolls Royce. I just want to smell it. Really, who cares? 
But see, when you're not right with God, you look for stuff like that to resent people. Really, I mean, hasn't God been good to all of us? Just go out there and look in the parking lot. God's been good to all of us. Some of you are old like me. You remember buying cars for 600 bucks and driving them, and wearing them out, buy another one for 600 bucks and wear them out. Huh? None of these kids know anything about that. They want to start off with, you know, brand new, whatever. Anyway. Huh? This boy's ailing because resentment's eating him up. Then notice their actions. I'm going somewhere. Hang with me. I'm having a good time. The younger son becomes repentant. Look again in verse 18. He said, I will rise and go to my father, and I'll say unto him, I've sinned against heaven, and before thee, and no more worthy be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Uh, verse 20, and he rose. He went and done it. It's one thing to say it. True repentance has works meet for repentance. Uh, there's a turning point. Uh, he not only thought it, uh, he said it, uh, and he got up and he done it. He turned from the hog pen and went back to the father's house. We see repentance. Uh, can I say the father's actions was he forgave and restored. He ran, fell on him, kissed him, forgave him. I don't even believe the father heard anything he was saying. He said, Father, make me a servant. The father's like, shut up. He just fell on him and loved on him. Told the servants, go get the fatted calf and kill it. Go get a robe and ring and shoes. I, I mean, the father forgave him and restored him as a son. What a blessing. Listen, I don't care where they come from. I don't care how far in sin they dwelt. Uh, if one of God's youngins uh, out there in sin come home, uh, we ought to fall on them and love them and restore them back to the fellowship of the Lord. Uh, what a blessing. Hmm? There's a message in them servants, by the way. I ain't going to preach it today. But they did everything the Father told them. Not one time did the servants say, Hey, Father, are you sure? Father, do you really know what you're asking? Father, do you really want us? The servants just did what he said to do. Can I say, our Heavenly Father tells us something. We shouldn't question it. We just need to do it. Anyway, there's a message there. The older son, his actions are prideful. Look again in verse 29. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years I served thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, uh, yet thou never gavest me a kid uh, that I might make merry with my friends. I'm seeing a lot of pooch mouth here. Yeah. I've done this, I, 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 you've never done anything for me, got the lower lip out, pooch mouth, huh? He wasn't thankful that every day he sat at the father's house and ate a feast. Right. He ain't thankful every day the father uh, made sure all his needs were met. Hmm? Look what he said in verse 30. But as soon as thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. I mean, this guy's eat up with pride and jealousy. Yes, sir. Hmm? I've seen that in the house of God. Somebody would get right with God. I have everybody in fellowship and everybody's in the people said, Well, I've been faithful all these years. A preacher never has anybody come and hug me. Uh, suck it up, buttercup. Amen. Shut up. Get right with God, and then we'll have a hug on you. Huh? I want you to notice about something about this younger, younger son, and we'll get right to the message. Notice the younger son, in his rebellion, he's enamored with the far country. Verse number 12, it said... Uh, or verse 13, not many days, younger son gathered together and went and took his journey into a far country. He'd heard something about that country. He began to long about that country, he began to lust after that country. He was enamored with it. Can I say the devil's real good about painting pretty pictures of sin? Can I say he engages in riotous living? Nothing was withheld from him. If you can think it, he did it. Then he becomes enslaved by a sinful life. Amen. You cannot sin and win. Right. Sin will chain you and bind you. Amen. 
Some people take a hit for the first time thinking this, I'll never get addicted to this, only to become enslaved by it. Somebody takes a drink of something and think, well, this is cool. I can, get it. I can handle it. Uh, only become enslaved by it and become a drunk. Uh, uh, some people think, uh, oh, I can dilly around uh, 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 with uh, pornography and it won't affect me only to become enslaved by it. Uh, 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 there are folks who are enslaved by illicit sexual things. Uh, there are folks who are enslaved by tobacco. Uh, there are folks that are enslaved uh, uh, by having their ego stroke. Uh, 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 listen, uh, uh, sin will bind you and control you. Uh, it may look harmless. It may look like you can handle it. But the devil never shows you the backside of the billboard of how many lives have been wrecked by sin. Look in verse 14, the Bible says, and he, when he had spent all, there rose a mighty famine in that land. He began to be in want, and here it is. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He became a slave. This is a son who spent everything the Father gave him, and now he's a slave. That's what sin does for you. Can I say he's emptied by sin's demands? Look at verse 16. He would have fain filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Can I tell you the worst place a Jew boy could ever be is in a hog pen? And he's in a hog pen... And he's so hungry, he'd eat the slop of the hogs. And I've seen when they slop hogs. There's nothing that appeals to me what hogs eat. But this boy's so hungry, he'd eat that stuff. Listen, sin can empty you of all the blessings God has given you. And you'll get to the point you'll do anything to feel your belly to avoid that empty feeling but praise the Lord he's enlightened about his father's house look in verse 17 and when he came to himself hallelujah for that moment when you come to yourself you know what that moment is that's the moment when the Lord speaks to you and opens your eyes to your situation when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's house uh, have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? Uh, aren't you glad the Lord opened his eyes? Amen. He said, The servants of my house are doing better than I'm doing. Uh, he said, I'm going to rise and go home. Huh? What a blessing when folks decide to come to the Lord. Hmm? Uh, when they realize God's got a whole lot better life for them than what they got in their hog pen. Huh? I'm interested in verse 16. Verse 16 simply says, And when he would have fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and the Bible said, And no man gave unto him. I ought to preach on no man. No man. Can I say when you're in the hog pen, when your life is controlled by sin, can I say that you'll find that no man will comfort you? Amen. He's in that hog pen. Where's all them friends he had when he was spending money on them uh, uh, in the far country? Uh, none of them came to comfort him. Uh, no man will come and comfort you in the midst of your sin. Uh, uh, when you're in the hog pen uh, and your life's a wreck, uh, don't expect them friends to come around. Uh, when they've got everything they can get from you, they'll drop you right now. Uh, hey, uh, those that you've given yourself to uh, that you think you love, uh, when you hit rock bottom, they'll not be around to love you. Uh, they'll not comfort you. Uh, hey, neighbor, uh, uh, your best friend uh, are those at the church house uh, who are praying for you, uh, who are wanting to encourage you. Uh, but when you're out in the midst of your sin, you'll find no man will comfort you. Uh, can I say not only in the hog pen, you'll find no man will comfort you, but you'll find no man cares about you. I'm thankful the Bible says that we're to cast all our care on the Lord for he cares for us. 
I'm thankful that at the house of God you can find folks who care about you, who will prop you up, who will carry your burden, who will be a blessing to you. But when you're in the hog pen of sin, uh, uh, don't expect somebody to come around and show you compassion and care about you. You're not going to find that in the hog pen. He didn't find anybody. No man came to where he was. Hmm? Can I say this? No man will calm you. Can you imagine the anxiety he had? Can you imagine the fears he had? Can you imagine he's in that hog pen striving to uh, uh, eat what them hogs are eating? Uh, how miserable he is uh, and nobody comes along and soothes him. Uh, nobody comes along and con- uh, gives him a kind word. Uh, nobody says it'll be alright. Uh, Joel didn't show up and say every day's a Friday. Uh, uh, nobody will calm you in the hog pen. Did I say this when you're in the hog pen? No man will carry you. Well, I'm thankful to know my 50 years being saved, there have been times I've been in the house of God and I couldn't put one foot in front of the other, but there was a dear saint of God come by and help carry me, sure. help bear my burden, sure. help be a friend to me and a comfort yeah. to me. I'm glad at the house of God you'll find folks that'll help you. Right. But when you're in the hog pen, you won't. No man. Can I say this? No man will celebrate you in the hog pen. Mm. Ain't nobody going to bring you a cake. Nobody going to come and show you a, 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 a wonderful time. Boy, he was out partying, thought he had the world by the tail. But yeah. when he lost it all, there wasn't no friends there. Yeah. Wasn't no party there. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Aren't you glad you can come to the house of God and worship the Lord and we can yeah. celebrate the Lord and you can be a part of a celebration every sure. time we come. Yeah. Yeah. And no man will celebrate you. When you're down there in the hog pen, you come around the house of God, folks will celebrate you. They'll be thankful for you. Uh, it's a blessing to be counted amongst the beloved. And I say, when you're in the hog pen, there'll be nobody, no man who will cheer you up. Why do you think when folks go down, they keep going down? Hmm. Keep going to the hit rock bottom. There's nobody there to cheer them. But aren't you glad when you're going through a valley, you come to the house of God and people cheer you on. People tell you to keep on keeping on. People be good to you. Uh, not in the hog pen. Can I say in the hog pen, there'll be no man to extend to you charity. Hmm. But in the house of God, we got a whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, about charity and showing charity one to another. No man will show you any charity when you're down there in the depths of sin and depravity in the hog pen. Can I say down there in the hog pen, you'll find no man to clean you up. I know you all think I'm a city slicker. I I know about hogs. (laughs) And can I say where they dwell is nasty. You can clean a pig up and he's going right back to the mud. Amen. Huh? And you hang out with him, you're going to get filthy. Yes, sir. But no man came to clean him up. Hmm? Aren't you glad you can get clean in the house of God? Amen. Down there in the hog pen, can I say this? There'll be nobody who'll clothe you. Mm. We got home, what was the first thing the father did? He sent for a robe. Isn't it amazing? Nowhere did the father say, go get that hog smell off of you. Uh, He's just glad his son came home. Uh, And his father clothed him, put shoes on him. huh? But down there in the hog pen, nobody was there. He said, no man. But I've got some good news. Luke 19, 10 is in the Bible. For the son of man came seeking to save that which was lost. Down the hog pen, you'll find no man. But I've got good news. The Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, left heaven, came in this old world, uh, 
uh, put on flesh, born of a virgin, uh, lived a perfect sinless life, uh, went to the cross of Calvary. Uh, he bled and died for your sin and my sin. Uh, hey, he took the ordinances of the law that were contrary to us uh, and he nailed them to his cross, uh, taking them out of the way. Uh, no man cares for you when you're a sinner and a hog pin, uh, but the Son of Man does. Uh, he came seeking you. Uh, he came looking for you. Uh, he don't care what you smell like. Uh, don't care what you look like. Uh, he's concerned about your soul. Uh, and he came and made a way uh, where you could be saved from your sin. Uh, he'll take you from the hog pen uh, and put you in the palace. Uh, one of these days we're going to glory uh, and we'll dwell with him uh, because he came to my hog pen. Uh, came to your hog pen. Uh, came to the ditch where you were uh, and he's willing to save you from the gutter to the outermost. Hallelujah. Can I say? Jesus will convert you of your sin. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Huh? He converts you from being lost in your sins and being saved by the good grace of God. I'm glad I got saved. Didn't deserve to be saved. I deserved to die in my sin and go to hell. But Jesus cared about me. He came to where I was and let me know if I was willing to accept him as my Lord and Savior, he'd certainly have me and he would change my life. Can I say that? Jesus will convert you. He'll cleanse you. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Huh? Aren't you glad Jesus came to save sinners and cleanse us from our sin? Uh, uh, listen, uh, in my flesh I fail the grace of God every day. But hey, uh, he saved me and he cleansed me from all sin. He cleansed me from my past sin, my present sin, my future sin. Uh, he cleansed me from all sin. Uh, I bless the name of the Lord. Uh, he shed his blood to be the propitiation for our sin. Uh, the Bible said without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sin. Uh, he took the darling son of God uh, to become your sacrifice and my sacrifice uh, that we could be saved from our sins uh, and be made children of God. Uh, listen, he converts you. He'll cleanse you. He'll change you. What he used to be I'm not anymore. I heard Brother Phil when he's testifying. He's testified before. Well, before he got saved, filth came out of his mouth. But he said over there at the jailhouse today, he didn't know what was coming out of his mouth, but it was the Lord doing it. Huh? What came out of his mouth today? Praise unto God, because uh, he's not what he used to be. Because uh, the Lord changed him. Before I got saved, I had a drug problem. I got drugged to church. Didn't really want to go, but that's what we did. My whole family was there. My granddaddy was the preacher. My granddaddy was kind of like the godfather. Ask Miss Lynn. Whatever he said went. You married into the family, it didn't matter. You did what Estel Jones said to do. huh? He called and said, Mom's got dinner on the table. That meant whatever you was doing, you stopped and you got there because dinner was on the table. huh? Just, I mean, that's the way he was. So I got drugged to church. That's what we did. And I, I got drugged to church uh, quite a bit. Didn't really enjoy it. Probably got a few whippings for carving my initials in the pews with a pocket knife I carried. Uh, didn't really enjoy all them songs they sang. Especially if the hymn took up two pages. I really didn't like that. It took forever. They'd sing every verse. Didn't like it. Huh? Didn't really mind the preaching because I didn't pay attention to it anyway. Oh my. This is my granddaddy up there doing what he did. But one day, started listening. And the Lord started speaking to me. Now I realize what my granddaddy's preaching, what he was preaching about, I was guilty of. Right. I was a sinner. Right. And I needed what he talked about, about being saved. 
And I say on the third Saturday night in March 1974, old center boy sitting about three quarters way back on this side of the, the church house came out, made his way to an altar, made his way to Jesus. That night, Jesus saved me, forgave me of my sin. He cleansed me, made a new creature out of me. Can I say, after that, I didn't get drugged to church. Couldn't wait to get to church. Right. After that, I couldn't wait to hear them songs they were singing. Uh, and got in on it, started learning what it meant. Uh, uh, I enjoyed preaching after that. I enjoyed reading the Bible after that. I enjoyed having a prayer life, talking to the Lord after that. Why? Because he changed me. Uh, uh, what I did not know then, what I know now, uh, that moment when I called on the Lord, uh, he did a supernatural operation. Uh, he cut away the stony part of my heart uh, and he moved in and took up his abode uh, and he lives within me. Uh, and I bless the name of the Lord what he did in me. Me. Things I used to do, I don't do anymore. Things I used to not do, now I do. Because I met the Master. Can I say, He converted me. He'll convert you. He cleansed me. He'll cleanse you. He changed me. He'll change you. Let me just say this. If you come and you say, yeah, I'm, I'm saved and I've been baptized, but you don't have a changed life. You didn't get saved. You just had an experience. When Jesus saves you, he changes you. But if you can't go back to a place where you met him and he changed your life, you're not saved. He changed me. And he'll change you. He's no respecter of persons. Can I say? Jesus will comfort you. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He said, my peace will I leave with thee. Not peace that the world have, but my peace. He has a peace that passes all understanding. In the darkest of days, he'll show up and comfort you. When I got diagnosed with cancer, I've got news for you. He was there every step of the way. And he comforted me. Huh? Can I say this? Even though in the hog pen nobody will care for you, Jesus will care for you. Uh, oh, what a friend he is. Paul said, nevertheless, or Paul said, all men forsook me. Nevertheless, the Lord stood by me. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And can I say this? Jesus will clothe you. He robed me in his righteousness. Just like the Father sent for the best robe that day that I got born again, the Father robed me in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when he looks at me, he don't see the sorry, no good sinner in the hog pen. He sees his son, Jesus Christ. What a blessing Amen. that I've been robed and clothed by the Lord. Listen, in this life you'll find no man until you find the man, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus loves you. He died for you. Yeah. And he'll save you from your sin. All you have to do is ask him to. All you have to do is say, Lord, I want to be saved. I don't want to live a hog pen life anymore. He'll save you. Change you. Be the best day of your life. Amen. The Lord has blessed me and my life so abundantly. You say, how do you have all the blessings you got? Because I have him. And he'll bless you too. I can look across this room. I can see folks that have been blessed by the Lord. Because you got him. Now let me say this and I'll be done. In a moment we're going to have an invitation. An invitation is just like you get an invitation in the mail. If you're here today and you can't go back to the place where the Lord saved you. We're going to invite you to come. You say, preacher, I don't know how to be saved if you come. We'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you how to be saved. It's easy to be saved. All you got to do is realize you're lost. Realize you need to be saved. Realize you're living in a hog pen. You don't want to be in a hog pen no more. He'll save your life. He'll change you. You may be here and you may be saved. Can I say? You may have strayed from the Lord and you've ended up in a hog pen. Can I say that boy got out of the hog pen because he took a step toward the father's house. This morning you just come to Jesus. He'll restore you just like that father did. You don't have to live in the hog pen anymore. You may be here today. You may have never went to the hog pen. 
You may have never uh, strayed from the Father since you've been saved, but you're like that elder brother. You got some resentment in your heart. You got some bitterness and unforgiveness of your heart. The only person to get that out of you is the Holy Ghost. And you need to come today and say, Lord, I'm tired of living this resentful, bitter life. Lord, help me. And he will. Life's too short to be bitter. Today, no man has controlled your life too long. Why don't you come to the Lord and let him help you. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. While we're getting a song, let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you. I'm thankful for the day you came to where I was. You changed my life. Lord, you've done it for me, you do it for anybody. Lord, I don't know anybody's heart. Lord, I, all I know is you put this message on my heart and told me to preach it. Lord, if there's anybody here today that's never been born again, I know what the devil do. The devil will start putting thoughts in their mind. Try to tell them not to come to the altar. Try to tell them they're okay. Try to tell them what, what all these people think. And tell, just fill their head with all kinds of stuff. But Lord, I pray the Holy Ghost would arrest their heart. Begin to speak to them. Let them know they need to be saved. And Lord, I pray that measure of faith you've given every man will be enacted. Lord, help them to take that first step. Lord, I know if they take that first step towards you, you'll help them take the rest. Help them to come and get born again. Lord, if there's somebody that's here in church, that's a blessing, but their life's in a hog pen. Lord, help them to get out of the hog pen today. Lord, if somebody's full of resentment or bitterness, God, help them to come to Jesus, get rid of that mess, and give them a joyful life. Christian's life's supposed to be full of joy and full of glory. Father, bless in this invitation now. Speak to hearts. Help folks to be obedient to the Holy Ghost. Bind the powers of hell. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.